Oh, hey Bio 30s, just working on my miming skills. Today, we are gonna be chatting about other patterns of inheritance. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about those exceptions to the rules I talked about last lesson. So we mostly focused on complete dominance. Today, we're gonna to focus on incomplete dominance as well as co-dominance. So quick recap from our last lesson here. Complete dominance is where one genotype, let's say for example, um, the genotype we're gonna look at is the hybrid genotype, big T, little t. We'll notice that this genotype has two differing alleles, one dominant, one recessive. In this case, the dominant allele will show through, giving you the dominant phenotype. So for example, if tall was the dominant phenotype, a hybrid individual would be tall. A homozygous dominant individual would of course be tall, and then the only way to get a recessive short individual would be um, homozygous recessive. Now, let's get into incomplete and codominance. For incomplete dominance, so for incomplete dominance here, um, it's incomplete. So what we need to think of is, there's a little bit of dominance, but it's not full, which means we get what's a blended phenotype, all right? So an example of this would be red flower, white flower. When we have a hybrid individual, a heterozygous individual, it would be a pink flower. So we get a mix of the two, red and white blended together to get pink. Co-dominance means that they are cooperating. They are both equals. So they're both dominant. So both traits show up. So we get a, <clears throat> excuse me, we have both traits showing up. So for example, if we had a red flower and a white flower, we would have a red and white flower. So you have a mixture of the two. So you'd have red and white. So let's get to a couple examples of each. So let's say for incomplete dominance, right? We have our snapdragons here. We have a red flower and a white flower, okay? So for the red flower, obviously we can see the phenotype is red. For the white flower, obviously we can see the phenotype is white. What would you expect the phenotype of the cross to be? Well, we would say, okay, red plus white should give us all hybrids if they're both um, homozygous. So they should all be hybrids and they should all be red. But when we take a look at it, they're not. They end up being pink. So we notice that we have our red and our white, and when we cross them all together, we end up getting all pink because this is incomplete dominance. All of our heterozygous individuals <clears throat> end up being a blended phenotype of red and white. Now notice how when we write the alleles here, we do something different. Now you can still stick to the capital letter, lowercase letter, but for these incomplete codominance as well as the multiple alleles, sometimes we're now going to add a superscript, either letter or number, to help differentiate between the two alleles. So C standing for color, R for red, W for white. Once again, how you set your Punnett squares up and how you make your legends is really up to you. But if this is an easier way to remember, okay, this is a red allele, this is a white allele. If we get two reds, we have red. We have two whites, it's a white, and if we get a red and a white, it's gonna be a pink. So, um, what would happen with the F2 generation? This is an interesting one. So we mix two pink flowers together, what do we get? 25% chance we have a red flower. So if we're gonna do our genotype ratio, our genotype ratio, oops, still on the high letter. So if we're gonna do our genotype ratio here, genotype would be a one to two to one, right? One genotype, two, and then another one. Our phenotype ratio, watch this, one red, two pink, and one white. So actually our genotype ratio matches our phenotype, which is quite nice. So you know exactly what phenotype you get, um, <clears throat> or sorry, you know exactly what genotype you have based on the phenotypes. You can just look at a flower and be like, oh, it's pink, it's a hybrid. Oh, it's red, homozygous dominant. It's white, homozygous recessive. So that's incomplete dominance. Um, I wanna do a quick cross here with sickle cell anemia because this is a good example of incomplete dominance as well. So with sickle cell anemia, you can be normal hemoglobin, sickle cell hemoglobin, or you can be in the middle, which is a carrier. So if you're a hybrid, you carry the sickle cell trait, but you don't outwardly have sickle cell anemia. 
So how does this work? Well, let's do a P1 cross of two heterozygotes. So HB standing for hemoglobin, A is going to be normal hemoglobin, and S is going, oops, I put those two together there. This, do. All right, and S is going to be the sickle cell allele. So you are a carrier or a hybrid for that. Let's get another hybrid here. Setting up my Punnett square, just like I did last lesson. And now we're going to match them up. So we have normal, normal. We have a heterozygous. We have a heterozygous. And down here, we then have single cell trait. So once again, our ratio for both phenotypes and genotypes would be a one to two to one. Question would then be, okay, what are the chances that they have a child who has sickle cell anemia? They have a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell anemia. Interestingly enough, um, people who are this genotype, so if you're a heterozygous genotype for this sickle cell trait, you actually have a resistance to malaria. So what they found was heterozygous individuals well, yes, if they do have, <clears throat> if they do um, have a child with another heterozygous individual, there is a 25% chance that their child would have sickle cell anemia, but they have a resistance to malaria, <clears throat> to malaria, which is pretty cool. Um, it has something they think to do with the enzymes involved and the shape, uh, because having that sickle cell trait um, gives you some type of resistance and the binding, the parasite doesn't like to bind to your blood cells because of that. Whereas if you just have normal hemoglobin or sickle cell hemoglobin, the parasite will affect you normally. So it's interesting that this trait, while seen as not a good thing, actually does have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to malaria resistance. Okay, next thing I wanna talk about, codominance. So this would be where both traits show up. So let's say, for example, we have cattle here, we have red and we have white. When we mix them together, we get a rowan calf, which is a mixture of the two. We have red hair and we have white hair. So we get a mixture of the two calves there. Let's turn that off. So we have red and we have white mixing together. Now, the interesting thing here is if we do a cross. So we're gonna do a cross here of a red bull and a white cow. Normally what we would expect is red and white, they should all end up being hybrids, right? So they should all end up being hybrids and they should all end up being red. But since it's codominance, both traits show up. So we're gonna have red hair, we're gonna have white hair, and then we're gonna end up having 100% row and calves. If we mix two row and calves together, we get a one to two to one ratio, just like our incomplete dominance. 25% red, 50% rowan, 25% white. All right, on to multiple alleles. This is the last topic here. So multiple alleles. What happens if a trait has more than two possibilities? So what happens if there's more than two alleles? So for example, in fly eye color, you can have red, apricot, honey, or white. You can have four different alleles. So there's not just two options, there's four options now. Now when we do multiple alleles, when we do multiple alleles, um, <clears throat> we refer to the wild type as the most common type. So in this case, red would be the wild type because it's the most common allele in this bunch. When we write our um, genotypes, we're going to use our lettering system again, but this time we're gonna continue using those superscripts. So we're gonna continue using those superscripts, in this case, E1 representing wild, E2 representing apricot, E3 for honey, and E4 for white. Now, we then go to a simple hierarchy here where there's complete dominance, and one allele is dominant to this allele, and this allele is dominant to this allele, and this allele is dominant to this allele. So you just have to look at the hierarchy. Wild, or the most common type, red, is dominant to all alleles. So it's dominant to apricot, honey, or white. So as long as you have one E1 allele, you're gonna have a red eye fly. Apricot is dominant to both honey and white. Honey is dominant to white, and white isn't dominant to anything. So the only way to get a white-eyed fly is an E4, E4. That's the only way. So let's do a little cross here. Let's say we have an E1, E4 or fly. So it's a red-eyed fly, 
with a red allele and a white allele, so it has red eyes. Then we have an apricot eye fly with an apricot allele and a honey allele, so it has apricot eyes. What are, what's going to be the ratios or what's going to be the outcome of our cross? Well, let's take a look. When we mix the two, we're gonna notice here red and apricot, so this individual has the wild type red eyes. We're gonna notice here red and honey, this individual also has the wild type, so 50% of the offspring should have red eyes. Look down here, we have apricot and white. This will give us apricot eyes 25%, but look at this. Since this individual carried a honey allele and it mixes with a white allele, we actually get 25% of the flies having honey eyes. So this, this explains why we get some variation, right, in a lot of our traits. So you can see that, oh, two individuals might have darker hair, but then they have a um, child who has lighter hair. So we see that there can be variation amongst uh, these multiple alleles. Now, the interesting thing is when we take humans here, we have a trait that is involved with multiple alleles, and that would be our blood types, right? Our blood types have multiple options. You can be A, you can be B, or you can be O. So there's three alleles for blood types, A, B, or O. Now, blood types get a little more complicated because not only are there multiple alleles, you have a little bit of uh, codominance because A and B are codominant to one another. They're equals. So if you have an A allele and a B allele, you have AB blood. Both show up. You also have complete dominance where both A and B are dominant to O. So if you have A allele, O allele, you have A blood. If you have B allele, O allele, you have B blood. So when we look at our blood types once again, and hopefully this is a review for bio, from Bio20, AB blood has both markers on their blood, A and B, because they have both alleles, an A allele and a B allele. And they have no antibodies in their plasma, so they can essentially receive blood from anybody, A, B, A, B, or O. O blood has no markers, and they have antibodies for both A and B in their plasma. And because of this, to get O blood, you would have two O alleles. Sometimes we use um, the uppercase I with an O or the lowercase I to represent O blood. So you get two O alleles to get O blood. A and B, A blood would have A antigens, antibodies against B. B blood would have B antigens, antibodies against A. A blood could be two possible genotypes. So if you look at our chart here, A blood could be two possible genotypes. You could be A allele, A allele, or A allele, O allele. B blood, also two possible genotypes, B and B, or B and O, because remember B is dominant to O, just like A is dominant to O. And then finally, only one possible genotype for AB, that's an A and a B, and only one possible genotype for O, that's an O and an O. Now, one final thing here, rhesus factor, we need to sometimes factor in the rhesus factor, the RH factor. If you are RH, if you have the RH antigen, you are RH positive. If you don't have the RH antigen, you are RH negative. This too is a um, genetic cross that we can do. So someone who is RH positive would be dominant or at least have one RH allele. Someone who is RH negative would be recessive and they would have and no, they would not have the RH antigen. So let me just do a quick, quick cross for you. Let's pick two blood types here. Let's say someone is AB positive. So that person is AB positive and they have a child with someone who is A negative, okay? So when I set up my Punnett square, I need to do a couple of things. One, I need to separate the two. This is a separate cross from this, all right? We, can't, we can do it together in a form of a dihybrid cross, which I'll show you how to do next lesson. But for right now, you may need to make sure that you separate these two because they're separate traits. The RH trait and the ABO trait are separate traits when it comes to inheritance. So when I write my Punnett square here, we have one individual with type AB blood. We have another individual with type A blood, and let's say, for example, they're also carrying an O allele. All right, so let me do our cross. We have AA, we have AB, we have A, and we have B. So this individual could have A blood, AB blood, or B blood. 
could not have O blood. 0% chance they have O blood. Next, we do the cross for these two. So we know that the negative would be, let me, let me fix that chart there. Not a very nice looking Punnett square. So we know that the one individual is double recessive. So they're gonna be little r, little r, using r because of Rh factor, rhesus factor. Uh, and this individual is positive, let's just make them heterozygous. So let's make them heterozygous. Do our cross. Rh positive, Rh positive, negative, 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 negative. So, back to our probability rule. What are the chances we have a child who is B negative? Well, separate probabilities, right? 25% chance we have B negative, 50% chance negative, that's going to be 1 out of 8, or 12 and a half percent. And you can do that for any of the blood types in that cross. So that's all I have for you today. Like I said, next lesson, we're gonna be going through dihybrid crosses, talking about how to do a bigger cross with two traits. And we're gonna talk about how those two traits would interact with one another. So thanks again for watching and we'll chat soon.